Welcome to another video here on Debaco University. In this video, we're going to be looking at hair and its relation to DNA. You can see here's a long braided hair, and here is the double helix of DNA. Now, DNA analysis is only possible if the bulb uh, at the base of the hair is intact. So keep in mind that bulb region is down here closer to the root end of the hair. The hair bulb forms at the base of the hair follicle, and in the hair bulb, living cells divide and grow to build the hair shaft. This is why it's important for DNA analysis, because the blood vessels that nurse the cells in the hair bulb deliver more hormones that modify hair growth and structure at different times, so that can be useful. In addition, those growing cells are more likely to contain uh, that important DNA when we're looking at trying to take hair, which is a class characteristic, and trying to get it more in the chance of being in the individual characteristic category. So here at different growth stages, uh, keep in mind that advancements in DNA profiling uh, can now individualize human hair. The, uh, the probability of detecting DNA at the hair roots is more likely for hair being examined uh, in different growth phases. And here we have the different growth phases. So here we have the early growth phase, which is all referred to as the antigen phase. Then we have the middle growth phase, that's the catagen phase, and then the telogen phase, which is the final um, phase here. Now here in DNA specifically, uh, when hair is forcibly removed, often a follicle tag, which is a translucent piece of tissue surrounding the hair shaft, may be present. And it kind of looks like this right here. This is a root with a follicle tag. Other uh, roots surrounded by tissue, this will have um, nuclear DNA. And this has proven to be a rich source of that nuclear DNA associated with the hair. Keep in mind if you're finding a hair piece, uh, without that the, the follicular tag here. Uh, the root is club-shaped. There's going to be basically no nuclear DNA located here. So this is kind of the gold mine here for finding that DNA. You have those cells around um, that kind of uh, root of the, of the hair. Looking at hair in the mitochondrial DNA, so mitochondrial DNA is found outside the nucleus and is transmitted only from the mother to child. So ideally, nuclear DNA is what we want to find, but mitochondrial DNA should not be overlooked because mitochondrial DNA can be extracted from the hair shaft. As a rule, all positive uh, microscopic uh, hair comparisons must be confirmed by DNA analysis. So again, why the mitochondrial DNA may only be tied to the maternal line uh, still can be important information. It can still help eliminate uh, potential suspects on a list to try to get to that more individual characteristic. Now, when we're collecting hair as a baseline, and ideally, the general rule, forensics uh, hair comparisons involve either head hair or pubic hair. So head hair, ideally we're looking to collect about 50 full length head hair samples from all areas of the scalp will normally ensure a representative sample. Pubic hair, we're only looking at about 24 full length pubic hairs or should cover the range of characteristics present in pubic hair. Hair samples should also be collected from victims or suspicious deaths during an autopsy. So a lot of times if you're just investigating um, a crime scene without a body, you may find hair samples, but it may be difficult to find 50. Uh, but if you're looking at particularly an autopsy or have the ability to collect hair and have access to 50 head hair samples or 24 pubic hair samples, those would definitely be advised because it would help determine uh, or reduce the natural range of hair variability to allow you to kind of get a little bit more closer to that individual characteristic when we're looking at identifying different hair samples.